the fear is, oh no, am I now, is it, is it becoming a cliche or a, uh, is it becoming kitsch or, or whatever you want? Or is it becoming, is it becoming, you have to lose, you have to lose that fear. I'd like to thank our top sponsor, Dean Anthony, for making this show possible. And welcome to the Cave of Apelles. Tonight, I sit down with a Danish tonal composer who visits the cave to explain why storytelling, not musical technicalities, is the ultimate goal. He will talk about the mixed reception of his work and indeed share some positive news about contemporary classical music. Not the least, he will speak to the sway modern values may still hold over classically minded people and how to counter that. Frederik Magle, welcome to the KU of Hellas. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. And I'm really happy that we finally made it happen. Uh, delayed. <laughs> delayed <laughs> because, because of some, some virus that, you, that, that came in the way, but now, but you're, now finally. Now you're here. Now you're here. Finally. And took the, tr the trip all the way from Denmark. And we're so happy for that. Thank you. Um, we're, so we're going to talk about uh, basically you as a composer, your, your experiences. But um, I think it's always a good place to start with your education because it never ceases to, to surprise me that someone wants to learn classical music and goes to a s classical sc or a, s a music school to learn it because you know, that's a, you're not sort of, it, there's not too much of it, right? <laughs> no, it's true. Um, well, uh, to explain my education, we have to go back to the very early beginning. Uh, my, uh, my father uh, was both a painter and sculptor and also a, uh, an organist and a, 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 a choir director, music director. Uh, first, he educated himself as a painter and sculptor way back, right after the Second World War. And then later in his life, uh, he became also a, a musician. Uh, so from the very early beginning, I was uh, kind of torn between, uh, I had, uh, I loved to draw and I had that influence from my, uh, from my father and I, I was apparently uh, rather good at it. I won several drawing competitions for, for children. But the music also uh, was of course a very big part. So I had both uh, the visual art and the music. But then at some point, you have to make a choice. And perhaps I was a little guided also by my parents. I don't think you can ever escape, for better and worse, your, uh, uh, completely escape your upbringing, your, your parents, your, uh, your family uh, uh, lineage. Uh, and uh, so, of course, that is where the early uh, influence came. And in, in the beginning, uh, my father, he taught me, uh, uh, taught the basic uh, theory and, and piano from when I was around five or six years old. Then I started to have private teachers, tutors. Uh, and then when I was uh, 15 years old, uh, right after the, uh, the school, the minimum uh, uh, required uh, school, ninth grade. I uh, applied uh, for the uh, conservatory in Copenhagen uh, and I applied on two majors. Uh, normally you can only have one. So I, I applied both as a composer and an organist. So I went to two different, what you call it, uh, exams, uh, uh, entry exams, completely different uh, twice. And I was accepted on both lines and I got a dispensation to, to actually to study both majors. Uh, at the conservatory, uh, which also meant that I had about 50% more classes a week than uh, all other uh, students at the conservatory. And um, um, obviously I learned uh, some, some, some good things at the conservatory, but also, especially, well, both as a composer and as an organist, I had uh, a very strong will. 
and I was on the edge with uh, several of my of my teachers. Uh, I had some great teachers, and I don't think anyone any of them were bad per se. But I was on the edge with them, and uh, at at some point, uh, I simply decided, after a few years at the conservatory, I decided that this was not this was not going. I could not I could not adapt. I could not. Uh, I had such a strong will to go my own ways and uh, not be led into uh, what you can say the uh, special conformity of, of the education. And again, uh, the teachers, the, a lot of the education was, was very good and of course you get all the basic stuff and you get all that foundation which is quite necessary no matter how, which direction you go. But I left the conservatory. Um, and then uh, continued my studies as a private uh, student of, of, uh, of some select teachers where, where I had a very good uh, connection. Mm. I think there's a lot of... Um, I hope... I think there were some problems with the uh, education at the conservatory, the, the system. Uh, uh, it was becoming, at that point, uh, it's of course many years ago, so 25, 26 years ago, uh, I left the conservatory. Um, but it was becoming more a... Uh, it was becoming very, very rigid in, and inflexible. Uh, and I am a strong believer in the... Uh, in the uh, what you call it? Um, uh, where you have the student and the master, uh, that, that kind of uh, education. Uh, uh, and uh, it was moving a little away from that. Of course, it was part of it, but um, so I left. Uh, but by leaving, I also uh, left the entire establishment and that network that uh, the education, the, the academic system brings. I left that behind. And uh, to the dismay of many people who, who perhaps thought that I was like, um, Yes, that I some kind stepped out of that world and became an outsider. Mm -hmm. uh, because you, you were, how was it? You were considered like a wonder child. I, uh, I, I, uh, was that in both fields, you know, performing and composing, yes, or yes, yes, I, 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 as I, a general I, musician, a composer. Yes, I, I was. Uh, well, you, you could say that, but I, I applied uh, entry for entry at the conservatory mm. at the age of fifteen. Mm. Normally, you have to be sixteen to come, but I was uh, given dispensation to to, okay. to start yeah. that early. Of course, that also meant that uh, for better and for worse, I was like. Uh, 10 years younger than the average age, maybe even more, because most of the students at the conservatory, most of them are classmates, if you like, if you will, uh, were perhaps uh, in their 20s, some even in their 30s. So I was like, I was always an outsider, even when I was mm -hmm. inside. But when you, were, were, when you went to the, uh, to the conservatory yes. and you were composing, were you composing tonal music at that time or how what was your I've always composed uh, music uh, with uh, melody and, and tonality yeah. I have also uh, I do not shy away from using sharp dissonance and I have composed music that is uh, even bordering uh, atonal music but I have uh, the sense of melody and the sense of uh, a tonality and the expression that that allows me to to use and that kind of uh, so it's not only a tonality but you, you can use it as a as a um, narrative element uh, i can use it yeah. as, as a and i do not shy away from using at mm. a tonality mm. in fact uh, <clears throat> in fact and i just said that i was an outsider even when i was inside mm. but i was not treated badly it i it, no. it didn't feel it, in any way they they didn't shun me but i was simply I always went my own ways. I, I can be a little uh, strong-willed or <laughs> stubborn, if you like, uh, uh, sometimes. But I continue to, uh, to compose uh, uh, um, uh, tonal music. And, and sometimes uh, we were given assignments to use to do something specifically atonal. With, a, for example, an, uh, what do you call it? A, a test or something like that. Not a test, but a... a you have to do something, uh, making some something specifically twelve tone. Mm -hmm. And my my teacher he uh, he observed that I was able to 
kind of make the twelve tone music sound tonal. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, uh, uh, how was the reaction? Actually, it was not a bad reaction. No. Actually, it was not a bad reaction, but. There were many factors. Uh, uh, there was not a single factor that led to my decision to to, le to leave the conservatory. I, uh, I, w I was I was on the edge with my teachers, but on the, with some of them at least, and I, on some of them I had very very good. Uh, but on the other hand, um, I also f I did not feel they didn't disrespect me. Uh, so it was um, it was. Uh, well, there is some. You, you simply didn't get what you needed. That I, was the basic. Yes, and and I felt, I felt. Looking back, it's difficult to say whether I was right or wrong. But I felt at that time that I was being, kind of like, tr molded into a specific a specific direction, mm -hmm. not like a, uh, a deliberate. It wasn't like they were saying, "Oh, we need him to do this," and mm -hmm. and and and. Yeah. But the whole system. Uh, yeah. uh, the whole academic system kind of like have a tendency to to select uh, a path for you and, that's, and that, that's interesting because I've noticed that with uh, several of the conversations I, I have with you know we had composers here before but you know but also painters or, or others working classically yes that they when they go to an institution mostly a state institution but um, they are not necessarily you know, chased or, or treated badly, but just no. very strongly urged to go this way yes. or implicitly urged. And then it always comes up when I ask, do the teachers say specifically, have specific clear reasons why you need to go in that direction? There's just, no, you just need to go in that direction. Like, yes. there, there's no... And, and I'm not even certain that it, it, is, it is a deliberate uh, uh, thing from the teachers. Yeah. Uh, I think it's simply become kind of just the way you do it and yeah. and the it's thought for <laughs> uh, this is the default yes yeah. and the way and the thought of of doing it differently is kind of like it's it's just um yes it's 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 hard to it's hard to say hmm. of course it's also so many years there were there were other things uh, involved uh um uh, back there in my decision to leave the conservatory, it was not only a matter of of being feeling I was being steered in in, mm. in one direction. It was also, of course, by taking that decision to to have two majors, which I was the only one at the conservatory at that time that w had two majors or at the same time. I did have these all these extra classes, and a lot of these extra classes are side uh, 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 courses, and I thought that was a l too little time for me to focus on on the on the main thing on the composing and on the playing of the mm. of the organ it was mm. it was like there was a lot of things and then of course my age being 15 all my classmates are in their 20s i mean even in the 30s it, they treated me well but i was just not uh, you're you're just a different place yeah. even though uh, musically speaking i was probably on up to level uh, of course but but uh, but Socially, uh, I was I was a very different place. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. And I have always been a little awkward also uh, <laughs> socially. So I was. <laughs> so that didn't help either. So there were many reasons. Mm. But if it hadn't been for that feeling that I was kind of like being steered and being being losing some of my uh, that was in, the individuality. Factor. That was the decisive. Okay. Yeah. It was the drop that yeah. that kind of like uh, right. that was the decisive factor. So I left. You, you left, and then you you f find or know about certain teachers within both um, execution playing and composing that you. you yes, and I I, uh, uh, I continued uh, uh, with. And, and, and learning, uh, 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 but but of course this means that I'm not part of the uh, academic sy uh, mm. uh, uh, system. For better and for worse, I would say that it has uh, it has caused a, a delay for me in in the way that uh, it has taken a long time for for my music and and uh, both as a composer and organist to kind of like that recognition. Because I was on a very uh, uh, being, I guess there was a lot were a lot of expectations for me at that time. Mm -hmm. I was kind of uh, very well known when I entered the conservatory, and um, 
And then when I left, it kind of like, uh, well, it didn't, not, it didn't from day one, but it kind of like uh, people felt that I was going in the wrong direction. But that's interesting that then, because I think, you know, I recognize a lot of things also within painting. I mean, generally with, for people working there, with classical culture, there is a lot whatever of there is, the, analogies, whatever discipline. I guess. But, um, you know, uh, speaking as a painter, it's just struck me well, basically yesterday when I was thinking that people think the most difficult thing is to paint the figure, and of course it is. But uh, not enough are prepared for the sort of the psychological or mental uh, opposition, or f for example, when you go out of the, the, the conservatory and to not then, or to, to sort of fall in, in terms of uh, attention, yes. that has a psychological effect too, or it must, must have made you think. You know? Yes, it, it, mm -hmm. it, it did. And, um, <clears throat> and I think that at some point it did have, uh, I did kind of somehow lose my way in the, uh, uh, my own way, because it was, uh, in around the around 2000 and, and that I did I did I, I did make some works that I'm uh, happy for today uh, but I think that uh, I uh, uh, did not uh, focus enough uh, attention and energy on on the excellence of the craft okay. um, yeah, but that's, not, uh, that's interesting when you seek out private teachers yes. for composition, yes, were they capable of teaching you, or were you mostly studying that on your own? I was mostly studying composition on my own. Uh, basically, yeah. I would say that as a composer, but uh, the private teachers is this, uh, more uh, music theory, and 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 it is more more the the craft. Yes. Okay. General general introduction to the principles yeah. and the craft yeah. itself, but uh, but uh, composition in the, the well the, the the composition itself uh, it is uh, uh, I wouldn't say self-taught because I don't believe anyone is hundred percent self-taught even if you are self-taught uh, um, you still get some input uh, <laughs> no 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 man <laughs> a woman is yeah. an island in that well in that you sense. see your, your your teachers are perhaps dead but they're still teaching you they are they are uh, but uh, but I did I did uh, uh, and don't get me wrong it is not that I was uh, making bad music or that things got worse but I was perhaps uh, not giving enough focus on on uh, on on uh, on the details in in the thing of the, mm -hmm. the the excellence in 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 the details so okay. so I was on a very bumpy road where there was this com combination of uh, simply being, yeah, also being shunned from the uh, uh, from the society for for bad reasons, but then sometimes these things can make can become an, a vicious circle where they where being pushed out also makes you perhaps not uh, it can influence your own work actually. Yes. Uh, so it's, it becomes a, like a self-fulfilling prophe uh, prophecy. Um, and I would say, uh, I would uh, luckily say that I, I, I do believe I've, uh, I've overcome it hmm. uh, but, now <coughs> as an you, adult. Can you speak a little bit just on that point? Because I think that is a fundamental thing to, for people to be mentally prepared for yes. not being accepted, not, not necessarily being persecuted, but no. just not being accepted. Yes. Like, can you... I mean, did you have like one sentence or one specific idea that made you keep going? Because, you know, you're composing, you're not necessarily getting it played all around and making a lot of money, but you're still doing it. Yes, I kept doing it uh, uh, without... Uh, 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 I, I, I actually never considered not doing it mm. because it's such an integral part mm. of me that... that um, it's like breathing and eating. I know that it sounds like a cliche, but but it's it's such integral. So so the thought of not doing it is simply well, it's it's mm. it it's akin to the thought of not living actually. Yeah. Uh, and luckily, uh, there were people th throughout who who still, even though I was uh, kind of like uh, an outsider from then on, there were people 
uh, who, who who still give me, gave me commissions and invited me to do concerts. So I I was not completely uh, locked out. I but that was sort of through word of, word of mouth. Always through uh, through word of mouth yeah. and some and some people who who kind of like supported me even. Oh. Even though, uh, and then I got some interesting um, commissions from the from the royal family for some some very uh, 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 large um, compositions and also playing for some some uh, ceremonies. Uh, this uh, this kept helped me keep me going. It didn't do any good for me in the uh, in sense of the uh, establishment, or if if you yeah. if you like, because uh, but it it was like a closed market somehow. Yeah, yeah but it did um, it did keep uh, keep me going. And I want to emphasize one thing: I do not believe there are any kind of like conspiracies. It's not like people are sitting out that well, maybe in a few individually isolated instances, but it's not like people are sitting down. Oh, now we want to persecute him for for doing for not doing like we did. it's not it's not a uh, a conscious thing it's kind of like it's kind of like a, bu- a humanly biological things it's mm. kind of like uh, sort of in group preference uh, yes and it's kind uh, of like uh, if we go back to very basic societies uh, uh, like <laughs> like apes it's it's kind of like the way we 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 uh, uh, join in groups mm. and live together mm. and we have to like form groups and and cliques Not that I'm ca- calling my detractors from a- for apes, <laughs> but, uh, but least, well, they are. But, but, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> but I think um, uh, I think there's absolutely something to what you're saying there, and I think uh, I'm so concerned with the, with the psychological part yeah. of the mental preparedness. Uh, that you instead of thinking, oh, I'm not being chosen. Oh, they don't look at me. They don't yeah. invite me. To, uh, I mean, what you're describing is somehow seeing it from from a, a um, bird's perspective, yes. bird's perspective, I, 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 and, and just and not being psychologically affected by it. Like yes. you know, well, why don't they accept me and like yeah. me and blah blah. Also, it's it's very easy to become bitter, and it's very yeah. easy to yes. it's very easy to think that it's it is a conspiracy and that mm. they are really out to get you mm. and as i said perhaps there are some instances of people sitting in small groups well, and I mean, say oh we don't like him uh, or something it's like definitely that definitely th- there are yeah, s- yeah. parts like but that on the, on the on the on a bigger scale uh, but i did become bitter bitter uh, uh, not 100% bitter because if i had become mm. completely bitter i would not have been able to compose anymore i would have just been 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 i would have shot myself out And but I, I did yeah. get I did get angry. I did get when I was uh, uh, when I felt that uh, I was being pushed out and not and uh, and people uh, didn't review or, or review my concerts or my music badly or something like that. And there was a time and I did get it did get to me. Mm. And it does. I don't think anyone it, also it, yeah. at some point you you, you have to <laughs> I mean, if it doesn't get you, then then other things don't get you, and you cannot create uh, stories and music. Um, most artists uh, are, have are sensitive people uh, uh, in one way or another. Mm. Um, and I was thinking, I, I wanted to get to that uh, to specifically how you tell stories and music, like like. Yes. Technic- be, be quite specific technically uh, uh, for a bit here, but. I think it's so fascinating the whole psychological part. So I just want to to uh, hear you say a little bit more about that. Yes. You, were you aware of? Uh, I guess you, at a certain point you you understand that you've gotten become bitter or too bitter, or whatever. Yeah. Or like, how did you deal with that? How did you solve it? Uh, because I think that's immensely uh, important to be aware of. Well, uh, sometimes uh, sometimes you do have to. Uh, Sometimes some kind, uh, some type of uh, Deus ex machina has to appear, and for me it could be many different things. But but sometimes you have to be, uh, you have to be like kicked out of it. And uh, for me it was uh, uh, the birth of uh, 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 my first child. Actually, certainly, uh, for me it will be different things for for everyone. But for me that that certainly not being so focused on 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 the ego yeah and being forced to not being fo- focused on the ego and suddenly i have this this small child and i have two children so and both time but of course the biggest impact in that sense came from the from the first because it was uh, it turned my world upside down 
Um, and uh, it turned out to be a good thing because uh, I was able to, that allowed me to, like you, you, you said, like look, take a, a, a look and look at it from a, from a distance. And you, because, because it's so easy to become bitter. And I, had, I, I, I would say, looking back, I was becoming bitter. Mm. And the thing is, as I said all, earlier, it does affect your music. Not that I was composing bad music, but it affects your ability to be creative and to, it, it hinders you. In, it can hinder you. Some people may ab actually be able to channel that bitterness into their art. And if they can do that and make some great art, then it is wonderful, of course. But I felt that it was hindering me. It was making it increasingly difficult for me to compose. Yeah. And I don't know if, you, if you've seen that in others, that's at least my experience within uh, painting, that this bitterness, for, and that's a strange psycholo psychological uh, um, um, effect. Yes makes you more like the things that you are bitter uh, about. You know, the, 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 the enemy, the, the, the people that are <laughs> yeah. modernist or whatever. Somehow it can steer people into making work that is not necessarily formally, but in terms of mindset, yes. content is, is more similar to it. It's a strange phenomenon. Yes, that could actually be. Mm. That could actually be. I haven't actually considered that no, if no. that is the case with my own work from from no. that from that time. And I also have to say the, this bitterness. It's not something that just you just don't just wake up one morning and then it's, it's, it's bitter. It's something that slowly creeps in. That's the problem. Now. And then right. you you need something. Uh, maybe some people are strong enough to uh, snap to get out of that on their own. But but for me at least, I needed something. Uh, in this case, the birth of my of my first child, my daughter, Katarina, to to take me out of it. I wouldn't say that I was, and <clears throat> there were there were other things uh, though. Also, this was like kind of like a, 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 a pivotal uh, uh, moment. But there were other other good moments also before. So, it, and I was never down in a level of bitterness where I could not work and or where it affected me so that I was. I had I did have at some point a uh, a writer's block or composer's block, if you like, mm. uh, that lasted almost two years where I could not write anything. Uh, and ended me ended with me going uh, getting a, uh, a actually a, a breakdown a stress breakdown where I was completely I didn't know who was prime minister or anything, <laughs> causing me to have a, like a, a recovery period of several months where I was like completely completely outside and then that was back in I think it was two two thousand and eight. So that was long before my uh, my daughter was born. So that I would say that was probably my low point. And from then on, I slowly climbed back up. But uh, with the birth of my children, it accelerated. Uh, it accelerated. I became more and more uh, able to to uh, detach, uh, to to get away from the bitterness, yeah. um, and also to understand that that no, yeah. It, uh, they are the other world is not the. It's, they are not my enemies. Mm -hmm. Um, but I have to, but there are, of course, a opposition. Uh, there's a strong yeah, opposition. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, you could say that they, in general, I, th I think there's a great point in what you're saying that it's just the, the default position is to go that direction and you have to not be, you yes. know, to be benefit from that. Um, and in any case, it doesn't benefit you to stand looking at what, what they're doing all the time. No. You know, concentrate on your own work. Exactly. And that's, that's the way it gets into the post thinking positively. Um, but, but that's also where we get to, to um, one thing I noticed, uh, I guess it's, it says also on your web, website, uh, that you are concerned with, with uh, moving the audience or, or creating feelings. And I guess creating stories yes. when, you, when you write. Um, can you say, I don't know if you want to talk about a specific work or talk about how specifically, just be technical for, for a little while here, <clears throat> specifically how do you create what kind of emotions and, and how yeah. do you... Well, well uh, you could say that uh, uh, my goal is uh, uh, with my music is uh, a, a kind of storytelling. But it doesn't have to be like a, a, a literal story. That no. doesn't have to be program music in that way. But it's instilling an emotion or several emotions 
that may change uh, in a uh, in an in an arc. Uh, so in that way, there is an, an analogy with the with the storytelling, and uh, I uh, have kept the ability to be affected and moved by my own music while I compose it. Not necessarily when I'm finished with it <laughs> that much, but while I'm composing, I'm able to kind of, uh, and probably also because I'm, I'm using so much improvisation. I don't improvise very much when I compose, but, but I improvise before I compose. Okay. Uh, and, and improvising, I have to I have to be in, in kind of like at two places at the same time. I have to be both an audience and be able to sense and be feel. Uh, it, it, it sounds very, very touchy feely, but it is. I have to feel the emotion and the emotional impact and to be moved by my own music. And at the same time, also have to be on, a diff uh, on the different, uh, behind the curtain and, and control the whole thing and be in control. The interesting thing about improvising is, of course, that you cannot, uh, you cannot um, uh, do things, change uh, the emotion as an afterthought, because it's, 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 it is real time. So you have to be like kind of one step ahead. And also, uh, uh, so you, you have to, the time is kind of warped. But the important thing is, when, as an improviser, you do need to be able to move, be moved by your own uh, music. When I compose, uh, and I would say composing and improvising, of course, has, uh, they are connected. But, but composing is, of course, uh, when I compose uh, uh, scores and, and, and things, they, they cannot be improvised. They have mm -hmm. to be meticulously crafted. Can I ask you, so, so the improvisation is sort of a warm-up or...? You you could For say specific, I mean, you you could say improvisation is a is a warm up uh, and sometimes I, I do the improvisation in my head uh, uh, um, uh, when I uh, when I composed uh, my my latest piece uh, a fanfare and anthem which was a commission for uh, the reveal of the rollout event uh, spectacular rollout event for the new F thirty five Danish fighter jets <laughs> very very strange but fun uh, assignment I love that so yes making a fanfare <laughs> for for these <laughs> billion corner airplanes that are but it was very spectacular it was it was great fun to do uh, and I loved it uh, uh, and yeah. finding the right theme was of course uh, mm. uh, uh, the difficult uh, often the difficult thing and that theme came to me in the middle of the night I woke up and I was uh, obviously it had been working in my subconscious in mm. some way or another but then I simply started to construct the, the th thematic mat material in my head for the main theme um, and uh, I woke up and I, I was too tired to actually get some real note paper. So I grabbed my phone and I just, the notepad, and I just uh, typed in the letters of the, uh, and hoped I could remember the rhythm of it. I, oh, luckily I could hmm. the next day. It's not always that you can remember things from hmm. when you wake in the middle of the night. But that is still a kind of improvisation. There is this, the thing that the, it, inventing anything there is an element of improvisation even if you do not actually perform the improvisation even just imagining music is a kind of improvisation in your own head hmm. and then of course came the big work of instrumentating it and then sh making a shape uh, the form because form is of course one thing is to have a good theme an essential thing but form is so important. And in my younger days, my weak point was the form because I was so full of good themes. Uh, I just, I could just pick them almost uh, at random, at will. But uh, making a really good form is something I was perhaps lacking, uh, lacking in. So, so this is something I've been, been, been working. That's, that's a kind of the craft, uh, craftsmanship of, of composing. But anyhow, uh, so I, I make a connection between improvising and saying that there is an element of improvising even in just thinking the thought. Then actually physically improvising, meaning that you, that thought is then uh, delivered 
uh, to your uh, instrument or your voice or whatever it is uh, you use as, as your ex medium of expression uh, in real time. So you have to be very quick, and you have to and you have to like you can't think it over and over and over again. Uh, except that, of course, uh, if you do make a mistake uh, during improvisation, uh, then uh, <laughs> there's this expression that uh, repetition legitimizes. <laughs> so you have to re re repeat the mistake. Make mm. sure to do that, <laughs> if, if at all possible. Uh, and then go with it. Mm. But uh, So improvisation starts. But, but what I'm getting at is that for me it's very important that while composing, b both improvising but also composing, I can sit back and then I perhaps can play it on the on the piano or on the computer or play it excerpts and and be moved by the music. I need to I need to I need to, I need to feel it myself. I need to f I need to uh, get the story if you like. Uh, again, it's not a necessarily a literal story. That may be so if it's music for a film or something like that. But but but. But is that then you start with that uh, sort of main theme, and then yes. you have to justify it and and keep the tension over that span yes. of time. <clears throat> and something else have to happen. In in this case, now, just uh, I, I use the, the this fanfare and anthem as an example because it's such recent, mm. so uh, the process is also mm. still very fresh in my mind. Uh, then uh, I knew I wanted a secondary th theme, the anthem uh, theme. Right. And uh, I thought of different things and it didn't click. But then I noticed that I had actually made on the second repetition, or the first repetition of the main theme, I had made a counter theme. It's kind of like a counterpoint theme. And certainly I noticed a pattern in that. And I said, oh, what if I take this one and this one and this one? What would happen if I put those together and boom? Mm. Then I had the second theme. Suddenly that came out. So that was... Uh, Within the same composition. In the same composition, yeah. yes. So it is the same as in screenwriting, plot and subplot, uh, so to speak. You could say there are many al yeah. analogies. Yeah. Uh, 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 I think there are many analogies. But did, didn't, I mean, it's just fascinating so, to me to think about how specifically you do it. I mean, did you look at it? And just trying to solve that equation, and you you, you saw the notes then as sort of as a, as a visual symbol. No, I was on the look. I was on the look. Yeah. A lot of uh, creativity, uh, I think, is uh, is uh, a matter of being uh, looking for uh, for for pieces that fit together. Um, but not looking too strongly, not being like obsessed with it, because then you could you could get to a point where you where you see too many pieces and you can't. Mm. So you have to you have to be able to like kind of be. And I suddenly I just noticed that. I'm thinking I'm trying to think back exactly how I did notice that. I had made this counter theme, uh, which runs yeah as a counter theme uh, upon. It's not the counter. It's it's not the entire counter theme because that 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 would not work. But then I took important elements from the counter theme and put them together, and suddenly it's so it's like a, it's 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 a it's a it's a it's a puzzle. Uh, it's a puzzle mm. piece, and it's such an epiphany when you suddenly take oh what if I did this mm. oh and it just fit together like perfectly. Yeah. But, um, but then it's not uh, so your inspiration. Then it's you're actually studying and thinking purely technically how you yes, can solve yes. that. Yes, I think I think uh, inspiration for me. I think it's very uh, and in general, I think it's a very misunderstood uh, 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 word. I think uh, it may be sometimes that you experience something very beautiful, vista or something like, that, and, and something comes to you. But it it can easily inspiration can appear in the dullest of moments. I, I would say you could just as well get the huge inspira uh, inspirational breakthrough uh, <laughs> standing in, in the like, queue in the supermarket than you could uh, you know, on top of a mountain. Mm. Mm. But that doesn't mean that you should not experience the top of the mountain and these things. I think you gather uh, the inspiration Wherever you go and wherever you, and then it, it reminds me a little bit about how I read about Shostakovich could sit in a crowded cafe and write and not be disturbed by people talking, whatever. That's it. That's uh, it. And yeah. sometimes uh, I I do uh, get uh, think that for me, uh, 
even though it can be annoying waking up in the middle of the night, <laughs> especially the next morning. But uh, uh, that complete quiet, uh, my eyes are perhaps even closed and, and the thoughts can just, mm. uh, uh, I can just work with puzzle pieces there. Mm. And then inspiration can come when you actually do work, when you do work. And that's um, simply sometimes just getting started. Even yeah, just go through it and then it starts rolling. Then just, more then just yeah. setting the thing in motion. But I'm not saying that you, you, you do need inspiration from many things, from art, from literature, and from them, but there is, it's, the connection is not one to one. You can, for me at least, I can't say, oh, I got the inspiration for this piece exactly at that point. It's very rare. Mm. Of course, there can be exceptions where suddenly it strikes me, but uh, correlation is not causation, so I'm not even sure if, uh, if yeah. it, if, even if I'm at a, a fantastic vista uh, or an enormously beautiful place, like, like for example, like your place here in, in, the, in Norway, it's, uh, in, uh, it's, it's an amazing place. But, I'm <clears throat> and if, but if I got some inspiration here I'm not for some music, I would not be able to know if it's actually from, from this place. Mm-hmm. Inspiration is, is kind of like, uh, it's kind of like a melting pot inside your own mind that you can, that you can stir in. And you get input from in from from yeah. Well, from yeah, you had a um, Swedish uh, author Jan Gyo said something really f- uh, interesting when it came came to inspiration. Yeah, it says uh, I I might be misquoting, but I think it said something like I'm never inspired. Sometimes I just it goes a bit slower than other days, but I just you know, go through it, and then it comes. Yes, hmm. um, I, I wanted to uh, you know on the note of of creating feelings to talk a little bit about uh, your work uh, Secret Garden but I think this is a good way to ins- a good point uh, to insert some questions yes. from uh, from our patrons and um, we'll go to the first one which is from um, Sean Roberts uh, uh, who's a top patron uh, if you were on your deathbed and could listen to one last composition what would it be Oh, that's a um, that's a, that's a good question because because of, obviously there are so many so many um, fantastic uh, uh, compositions. Um, <clears throat> if I could listen, yeah, well, I, I can only listen to one, but if I could listen to two, <laughs> I, would, uh, I would probably start with the uh, introduction and curia from uh, Mozart's Requiem. And then, depending on whether I had some more time, <laughs> <laughs> I could listen to, uh, uh, especially perhaps uh, the last moment of uh, uh, the ending of uh, Mahler's second symphony, which would be a very uh, appropriate thing because it's uh, it has the uh, the uh, subtitle of uh, the Resurrection Symphony. <laughs> but it's yeah. ex- with that said, it is splendid. The, the build up at the at the end of this work. It's completely amazing. Mm. And then I think uh, the introduction in Curie uh, from Mozart's Requiem is some of uh, the high point. It is just utter perfection. Mm. It is utter perfection. The rest of the Requiem, his Requiem is, 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 is great, but it's, it's, uh, he didn't finish it himself. It's Sussmeyer and who, whoever w- worked yeah, on exactly. it. So, so you can hear that the orchestration is not uh, necessarily uh, the same the same uh, uh, clarity. It's, it's not bad. I don't, <laughs> don't misunderstand <laughs> me. It's great, but uh, the two, the the first movement, the first in, introduction and in curie is is like perfect. Mm. It's it, it ends on this open chord, and it's it 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 never fails to get to me. Um, we also have a question from uh, another patron here, Lasse Bohm. Um, have you got? Have you got a favorite organ? The instrument that has really impressed me is the one in the, the Nidaros Dome, the only cathedral we have in Norway. Have you played it? 
Alas, mm. uh, in fact, this is the very first time I am in Norway, so I have never played any. I know uh, there is a, 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 an amazing instrument, or actually instruments, I think, that are uh, built together. Is a, is a, a Valka organ or in Nidaros. I would love to play it one day, uh, but I do not. I have not had that pleasure uh, uh, at, at this point. Um, We'll see, we'll see what we, we can do. <laughs> that would be great. Uh, we'll do a field trip. A field trip, yeah, well, yeah. wonderful. Um, I, uh, speaking of uh, favorite organs, um, it's difficult to, to, to say exactly, but I would say perhaps the organ that had had the most profound uh, uh, impact on me is probably the Valka organ in Riga Cathedral in, in Riga. Latvia. In yeah. Latvia. Uh, built in, I think it was 1886. Uh, at that time, uh, it was the, uh, the largest pipe organ in the world. Uh, but it's not its size that makes it. It, it of course, the size gives it a uh, a certain power and a certain greatness. But the individual voices are so beautiful. You have like 124 stops or registers at your disposal. And you can make this enormous sound, this visceral uh, physical feeling of the, of the enormity of the, of the sound. But the beauty of it is that even the, sweet, the softest little flute or string voice is almost perfection in, 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 the, in this. So it's, it's been a great uh, inspiration for me. So if I had, if I had to pick one, just one. I would probably be that one, but there are many other great organs, uh, obviously. And I'm also very happy with. Uh, I have to drum <laughs> uh, uh, my own horn a little because I'm also working as an uh, organ consultant, and uh, so far uh, a third organ is in 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 the construction phase or in the, in the process of of being. Uh, it's not being built yet, but it's in 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 the process. But so far, uh, two pipe organs in Danish churches has been built to my specifications and to my uh, sound design or tonal design, if you like, where I make the specifications right down, which reg registers and which materials and, 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 and then uh, the organ builder, of course, constructs it. And there is a, a voicer, uh, you call it voicing. It's a, uh, it's a, a ma it's, it's an art form where every pipe is being um, sometimes it's, it looks like a can opener sometimes you it's 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 being uh, filed and it's being it, it's been molded tuned. Yeah, yeah tuned but not just tuned but voiced it gets its sound when you put in the pipes from the factory they have hardly any sound it's just like pfft, and then you you mold the sound of it it's and then the, my process is that I arrive I come once a week or once every second or third day or something like that and and hear a new voice being being readied and then we discuss can we could we lighten it a little could it have a little softer touch or stronger uh, stronger um, chip or, or whatever and it's an amazing process so I have uh, uh, been involved in the construction of so far two organs one in Jolona church and one in Trikona church in in uh, in Sealand in in the uh, and I would say uh, they are, of course, also among my favorite organs because they are literally uh, uh, made to, to uh, as the best I can I can imagine. So it's they are for me perfect instrument. Well, they're not not perfect. Nothing is perfect because there are so many things. But you're but, quite happy with them. <laughs> but I'm very happy with them. Yes. Uh, right. <laughs> um, here's another question. Um, Okay, it's a little longer. Um, have you pursued model composition or partimenti as a way of studying the inner workings of musical form? It would be very inter interesting to hear you and Mr. Tubes take on the often used metaphor of architecture to, to describe formal construction and also the common comparison made in music, at least to rhetoric. So I guess it's kind of open. So um, the connection between uh, form, musical form and, and architecture mm. Well, you, you, there is, of course, a, uh, a um, uh, you could make that co correlation or that analogy uh, uh, between it. Um, <clears throat> 
but um, but I would say uh, I am when I'm I I probably think more in 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 in, in ways of the, in the storytelling uh, storytelling way, but I think architecture is of course also a, a multi uh, a, a multi art where you have a, a work that needs to have a specific function and have some very specific functionality uh, within it. And you could you could say that uh, you could you could make that connection with uh, with uh, for example. Uh, um, I would say uh, perhaps a, a film where you have to have speci a specific uh, uh, movement of the story and the music is part of it. So I, I consider architecture uh, like a, a, a multi uh, a, a multi a multi art form. What was the first uh, part of the question? Because I'm have you pursued model composition? Model model composition a model yeah. Yeah, it's just it's just a model there, so I'm thinking about a model. Yeah. Um, yeah, yes, or or partimenti <laughs> partiment as a way of studying the inner workings of musical form. No, no, actually, uh, well, yes and no. Not in a uh, literal, direct sense. I have not, I have not specifically worked that, uh, worked with that. But I think that in the pursuit of uh, of form, you will inevitably pursue you will inevitably in get inspiration and and find knowledge which you can incorporate in in uh, in your own work because uh, obviously one have to remember that knowledge in itself uh, as a as a composer is of course very nice to have but it has only it uh, it has only value when it is actually set into function Mm. When it's converted mm. to something, yeah, functional. Well, you have to have the heart and craft, uh, I guess. So, so it makes me think of one thing: Can you compare it to, uh, you know, one way of starting a painting? I always talk about how you want to get the sort of the unfinished totality first, and then you have to have some anchor point where you sort of say, you know, this is where I'm yes. starting to build the solidity, and then it spreads from there. And in that sense, of course, you can have that wonderful idea. Or that that um, theme that that um, uh, that goes in your head. Yeah. Um, but in addition to that, of course, you have to be able to you know construct and think purely, well, purely rational. I mean, to, to really yes, judge yes. what what effects work and what effects don't, and that has to do with you know feeling. What no, 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 no. You have uh, to. Yeah, and that's the that's the that's the interesting thing about it. You have to be able to feel, but you have also have to be able not to feel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you have to be able to. Uh, 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 to what do you call it? Kill your darlings, um, mm. which is something um, You've I have a worked a lot. <laughs> uh, I do a lot. I do a lot. Uh, 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 last year, the funny thing, uh, I, I had a different uh, uh, piece of work, uh, also a fanfare, but not this one for the one. But I got a very uh, also an amazing uh, uh, commission, and this one was from the uh, Royal Danish Orchestra, the Kongli Kapel, which is the oldest uh, orchestra in, in well, in actually in the world. Uh, and um, the brass musicians have joined together uh, and asked for permission for the uh, for the leadership of the of the orchestra and the theater to commission a official an official fanfare for the orchestra from me so there was a, a splendid job um, and I was working on it uh, and I had a problem getting into it I I had uh, the fanfare should not be more than about like three four minutes at most but 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 f about three minutes because it, it, it should it, it's like a it should be not a large scale piece it should be a, a fanfare um, and I was working, I was working, I had a, some good ideas, I thought at least. And, uh, and this was before the COVID uh, lockdown. And the, uh, the idea was that the piece should be uh, premiered at the Queen's 80th birthday. There were a big gala uh, uh, show or concert, if you like, uh, at the Royal Theatre. And then they would open it with this piece and it would be amazing. And they, of course, the Queen and Royal Family were there and, and every, we were very festive. And then suddenly, while I was in the middle of composing this piece, then came the COVID lockdown 
and it was everything was shut down and the concert uh, the the uh, celebration was cancelled and uh, i was told not to to go any further with the piece in this to to uh, not at least before so i i put it aside and then suddenly two weeks before uh, the 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 well three weeks perhaps before uh, the birthday of the queen then i got a message that uh, they have been discussing perhaps to do a like a lockdown version where the musicians who could not come to the orchestra would record each of uh, their part from home just with the mobile phone and then they would mix it together and they would present it to the queen as a gift uh, and show it to her on her birthday at the castle. And uh, I had stopped working on it. <laughs> so I was only halfway through. But the great thing was that suddenly I realized that my form was wrong. I had made a piece, I had three minute piece, and I had made a piece that had a, a large buildup and I was already almost a minute in and, it hadn't, and the piece hadn't really set in. So I uh, killed my darling and I threw out everything I had made. And then I worked around the clock for two weeks, literally around, correct? it was like, my, like three or four hours sleep. And I work, 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 work uh, for 15 to 20 hours every day, two weeks. And, uh, and I made the fanfare. And I got, I, the, the whole thing was, first I needed a new theme and I needed it fast, really, really fast. And it needed to be a good theme. And uh, so this was also one of those things that came to me in, in, the, in the night. I was just, I couldn't sleep because I, I knew this was make it or break it. I could not let them down. Uh, so, but it, it came to mind I, uh, again in the, in the night. Uh, not some big inspiration input from some, something made, just the quiet of my mm. own mind. Mm. And then I got it and I had it. And then I just, it took some days and I was getting a little anxious, but I, I finally, mm. sometimes I feel that it's important uh, for a composer or any artist to, to kind of like, there's also, there is a, there can be a lot of fear involved mm. in, in, in creating fear. Is this good enough? Is this, is this, uh, will I get, will I find it? Why, why is it not coming? Why can't I, why can't I get it? And you, um, uh, have to kind of like, uh, what do you call it, train yourself into becoming less, uh, uh, less, uh, less fearful uh, mm. it, of it. it. It reminds me of, um, that, that, that really stuck, me, stuck with me from a conversation I had with, a, with the actor uh, Rune Tempte. Mm. And he talked about, you know, when you're on set, and you, you don't, it's not really your day. It's like you don't feel feel like it, but you know how many dollars it costs per <laughs> minute or hour or half hour. And he said, it's not about you. Get the job done. <laughs> you know? And I think that that's the wonderful thing also with with uh, a commission like that. Yes. That it's not like oh, I shall express myself, but here's the craft. I need this, and how can I do it? And it sounds, of course, very sort of. Well, it is very unartistic because it's not that big genius, just feeling. But I think that's what you need to, to um, or, or the, the, there's a great strength in that because you yes. don't get focused on the art me, is me, often me, me, me. The art is often in the detail. Mm. Uh, often there is a, a uh, and we, um, and this is, uh, brings, this is, springs from the, what we discussed about form. Because in such a case where I have this fanfare, there is, of course, I do have some limitations. I have a, a, a specific instrumentation, orchestration. I have some specific instruments to work with. I have a specific length, mm. approximate. It, it doesn't matter whether it's like 10 seconds longer or shorter, but it, it should be around that. Mm. And I have a specific goal for the music. It had, it mm. was a f I was commissioned to do a fanfare. Mm. So... Uh, you narrow down your options. <laughs> that kind of narrowed down the <laughs> options. So uh, still a lot of things happen. I have a, a, a middle part. Also, there were a, a specific wish uh, for me to hide some, to hide some, uh, some uh, uh, well-known Danish themes uh, or, or uh, quotations, if you like, within it. 
so if you listen very carefully, you can hear the Danish national hymn, and you can hear also a quotation from uh, Carl Nielsen's opera Saul and David. It's just very small. It's very small fragments. They're hidden inside. Um, I was not told which themes it should be, but it, it was a. Uh, so this is a really a musician's piece. It's really mm -hmm. written for these musicians. Yeah, yeah. They commission it and it's written with love for the orchestra and for the musicians. Mm. Um, it was great fun and it turned out luckily to be a, 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 a very good piece <laughs> and a great success. So that's, they were happy about it. Um, that, that's, that's a fascinating story. <clears throat> here's, a, here's a question from um, Instagram. Um, what are your, what is your relationship to Gustav Mahler's work? And if you were, if you were able to speak with him, what would you ask about? Oh, the first part is, is, is easy. Gustav Mahler's work has been a, a great influence uh, for me and a great inspiration and uh, a great love for, for uh, since, since my childhood. Uh, uh, for a long time, actually, his eighth symphony was one of my favorite uh, uh, pieces of music uh, when I was a child, and I still love it. It's not that, uh, uh, but um, uh, there's uh, so much great music by Mahler. Has a, it, it really resonates with me the music of of, of Gustav Mahler. Uh, also, I mentioned earlier that uh, uh, the thing with the deathbed and the second symphony. Mm. Uh, I would say, what would I, what would I ask um, specifically? Well, I would very much, uh, indeed, I would want to have a conversation with him. Um, but I don't have, and I would have many questions, of course. But, but. I believe strongly in the conversation. Mm. Um, I very rarely have questions that are like uh, not connected to that are out of con of a specific context. Mm. Uh, I'm sure it would be a, a great inspiration to uh, to learn. Perhaps I would I would prefer rather to depending now. On, I don't know whether he was the talkative type or not. Um, but I would perhaps uh, prefer just to listen to him mm. and listen to what he had to say and absorb. And then I would probably have some questions. But uh, right now, sitting right here now, I don't think I can uh, uh, think of a, a very specific question, uh, just one question. Yeah. I would have many, yeah. but I would rather just... Uh, if he wanted to talk, I would, I would, and 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 tell about his work, and 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 um, I would, I would listen. Yeah, I think about it too. Also, if you are a a uh, an authority on on a topic, I think also if, like if you see it from his perspective, if some guy comes and has that one question, you know, what's the secret for you know the great composition? Yeah. That's like, okay, calm down, you know, let's just talk. <laughs> I think you know from his perspective that just having a, a serious interest in just having a conversation about music yes. and not can you give me some fast advice that I can use. Uh, so I have some questions for you then. Good. So we're getting towards the end here to, to, to try, try to sort of merge two things at once here because I want to hear you talk a little bit about uh, that um, um, uh, composition Secret Garden. For oh, yes. Why it was made for whom etc. And also because that I well, I guess we've touched upon it a little bit, but um, in any case, this, you know, you have, have the, we're all sort of grown up with this, this um, osmosis where we, we breathe so-called so modern values. And uh, especially when you work with classical, uh, classical discipline, it's, it can really sit in your, your backbone, even though you think, okay, I'm really clear about my classical values. Suddenly there's some thing that, things that hinder you because they sit emotionally that you shouldn't do this or that or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if you could speak to that. Well, uh, so, so I will, I'll just take the first part here about, mm. uh, about that osmosis, about that, uh, yeah. about the dictomy between the modernist, uh, if you like, or modern values and classical values. I think, um, I think uh, 
any value can hinder you when it becomes fear-based, when it yeah. becomes a fear. Um, um, my my problem, my issue with uh, uh, with the modernity or the uh, the modernism, is not so much um, um, it's not so much that it exists because I think it's great that it exists, uh, but the 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 fact the fact that it has become kind of like the only acceptable. Uh, 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 form within the ac academics or within the uh, well, establishment, if you like, yeah, for, yeah. for lack of a better word. Yeah. Um, I, have pers I personally do not have anything uh, against uh, modernism in itself. What I have ag against uh, when it becomes a problem is when it becomes a vehicle for kind of like uh, an oppression. I have, I have, for mm. example, to to speak of a non-musical subject on architecture. I have no problem with modernist architecture. I have a problem when uh, it becomes uh, detr detrimental to uh, the well-being of people. Mm. When it becomes uh, when it becomes a manifestation of something ugly and the people have to live there in, for example, in, in big uh, housing construction mm -hmm. uh, places. Uh, there can be many good things in the, in the modernism. I'm very eclectic when it comes to, uh, to genre. So, so when you say that you have this modernism inside you, well, you do probably because we have we are all raised on this uh, on this idea. I, I would have to say that interestingly enough, uh, the classical, if you like, uh, ways of art uh, has not been eliminated, uh, even though it has been attempted. And there were at at certain points, uh, periods in time, perhaps in the fifties and sixties and seventies, uh, in that uh, post-war period, um, there has probably been. It has then it was it was unthinkable to do to do uh, uh, no, getting back to music it was unthinkable to do tonal music or to do uh, uh, it was really 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 not acceptable I think there are uh, uh, slowly slowly very slowly but there is slowly uh, getting more acceptable to uh, of tonality and melodic music and 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 to bring and to reintroduce these things but it never went away uh, even though uh, it was attempted you could say to to eradicate it not to eradicate the past because but to make it kind of like yes fine tone music but these are for the these are for the existing music by the great old composers it's illegal for a modern composer to to make uh, to make tone music i think um, perhaps it's 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 it's, uh, it's uh, there is a uh, it, it's it's not that ex exact it wasn't exactly illegal but it was not it was frowned upon mm -hmm. uh, especially back then in the fifties and sixties and seventies and even in the eighties and even when I uh, even when I started I would say even up to the nineties uh, it was still very much not acceptable and it was considered a second grade. Uh, uh, form of music or form of art to do uh, to do tonally or melodic or classically inspired music, but uh, but I think the, the 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 important thing is that uh, to avoid the fear because yes, as you say, you have that, but then that but as you mentioned, oh, I can't do that and I can't do that. To try to break out of that fear of not being able to do to do that i i have uh, i'm not perfect and i uh, i still have uh, we can all have mental issues from time <laughs> to time <laughs> but uh, uh but i uh for example for the secret garden i was able to break out of the fear of creating a new piece of music and and i i let i I was able to eliminate my fear, and it became a co almost completely total, tonal piece of music. Mm 
Does that have to do with uh, uh, with the, the fact that it was a commission for a specific? Of course, the, the specific purpose for this music also has an in, uh, had an influence in yeah. it because uh, I knew that I had a very very specific. Uh, I'll just shortly tell the story about uh, the Secret Garden. It's a uh, started as it, and it is what you could call a Gesamtkunstwerk built for the radiation therapy ward at the Rich Hospital, the, the uh, main hospital in Copenhagen, in Denmark. And uh, it's, it was uh, uh, began by the artist Maria Dubin, who also happens to be my sister, uh, and in collaboration with a, a, light, uh, a, a, a light designer, um, uh, yes, uh, called Kim Bork, and then uh, I, I did the music. And what, 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 how it was made is that it is uh, the first part of it was, was there was this stairwell down to the, because it's underground, because they have these uh, big uh, machines that needs to be underground and protected by radiation and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, so there was a, like a very steep stairwell and it was like going down to uh, uh, an underworld. And it was not a, pl a pleasant thing. So, so basically, what what has been done is that Maria has made has has made colors in a, and called it a, inspired by a garden, a secret garden. Uh, like there is a secret garden below ground here, a hidden garden here down. And and then with the light, there he uh, Kim Box uh, put the lights in, so it had been like kind of like a daylight, so you don't feel like going down in oh, a uh, in a in a uh, abyss. And then, at the bottom level, there are two very comfortable uh, chairs, uh, old chairs that had been re, uh, what do you call it? Um, refurnished? Or yeah, refurnished. Yeah. Uh, and you can sit down there and you can listen, there are some speakers and you can listen, you can put your hand up on a uh, non-touch uh, 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 switch and then this music starts. I composed this work. So basically, but I decided that I did not want to compose like some kind of like meditation music or something and background music that would uh, I would com create a real uh, composition, a work, uh, uh, and I would uh, make it for a chamber orchestra. It was recorded with a uh, chamber orchestra in uh, in uh, in Nish in Serbia, and they did a splendid job. Uh, and it's a it's a specific work. It's like it's eleven minutes long. Uh, and you can hear it. You can also stop it again. It has. I didn't want to enforce it on people uh, that are there. But here we get to the to the point. This work, the whole Kasamkunt work, is made for the patients, the relatives of the patients, and the staff. But especially, perhaps, with the greatest focus on the patients themselves. So, um, so this leaves out. Uh, I think. Uh, a very harsh, uh, atonal uh, piece of uh, music, but I didn't. So, so I decided I would compose a tonal piece of music. Also, I decided that I would uh, uh, not shy away from being inspired by uh, film music. Also, because remember. These patients, they come from all, probably only a short, a short, a small uh, sample of these people are actually uh, enjoy classical music. Most of the, uh, most of them may not uh, like classical music, I think, but that maybe they like film music because the, the film music idiom oh, right. is uh, this character. So I used, it's not like a big Hollywood score on that, but I used uh, a tonal palette, which I also did not shy away from entering into what you could call an almost filmic, very visually inspiring music, very image uh, uh, heavy music or image. Uh, I did not, but be, in order to do so, I had to be unafraid because going all the way, this is perhaps, I've made completely tonal music before, but this is perhaps some of the even most, there's very, there are dissonance in there and it's, 
I decided also that I I could not just make something that was like happy, happy, joy, joy, and and and, and superfluous um, in that way because that would be like be condescending to the to mm-hmm. the patient because these are people who uh, are well, it's, it's very, very, you're very ill. ill and, coming and back to the question, the music you would want to listen to potentially on your deathbed. So and this could uh, this could could, could uh, is this music or not? In, in the death of, but uh, uh, we know that many of the patients will not will not yeah, yeah. will not survive. Uh, so I did not want to make some music uh, that was uh, that was overly uh, uh, happy or, but of of course I did not want to 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 be the opposite. It had to be kind of positive, but it has also some uh, uh, touch of something I, I don't think melancholic is probably the wrong word but it has it has some it has it has a broader scope it has a, a, a bigger emotional palette but uh, first and foremost I, I hear I really wanted to tell a story I really wanted to bring the listener if they if they want to go in there and they can always stop it and they can always leave it it's it does not be it's not being forced upon the upon the listener uh, I wanted to run it to take them inside uh, and create this almost filmic world, with, but without a film, of course, but in where they can close their eyes or whatever they really prefer and simply be absorbed in a, uh, mm. in, a happy, uh, in a happy place. But it wouldn't be a happy place if, if the music was like overly happy. But in order to do so, in order to do something so unapologetically tonal and so unapologetically uh, uh, T- story and emotional and storytelling mm. uh, like uh, I, I really had to uh, lose a lot of uh, fear and I started out with a lot of it took a long time to find out where uh, to how to to do this it was uh, I went there for the hospital many times but also also had to think very I the the start of the project was almost like six months or something before I finally lost could could uh, could lose all fear i had to really be truly but fearless specifically fear of what fear of uh the fear that is that when you do something like that you have a very specific uh the fear is oh no am i now is it is it becoming a cliche mm-hmm. or a uh, is it becoming kitsch or, or whatever you want or is it becoming is it becoming you have to lose you have to lose that fear you have to lose that fear and and so so, so it it's, can be, it's a fear of sentimentality yes is it becoming senti- emotions is it becoming sentimental mm. uh, I would say I don't I really truly believe it's it I, I avoided uh, a wrong sentimentality it's I think it's very emotional but I don't think it's sentimental. Yeah, I, I think when you talk about, I mean, of course, uh, I come from a position where I've investigated quite a lot into the, the, the kitsch term. Yes. And using it, and I think it's a proper name for a narrative classical culture which is, has strong pathos, if you see there's something positive. But there's a different discussion. Of course, but, I, yeah, and yeah. I perhaps yeah. misused the, no, the expression of this. I used it in the... Uh, uh, the way it's normally used. Yeah, yeah. Normally but, but used. It's, it's interesting because it is an education indication of sort of these modern values that sort of stick yes. in you perhaps unconsciously yes. and that hinder you in and that, creating that uh, dramatic and story. Ex- right? uh, so exactly. Yeah. But I, I finally could lose that fear. It took yeah. me months to lose it. And it was a, yeah. it's a mental process. Yeah. And finally, I lost it completely. And I was utterly fearless and and if I, ha- I could not have done it and the interesting thing you, you mentioned that sometimes you get it would have become sentimental in the wrong way or if you like if if I had not lost the fear yeah because I th- that's, that's the point I want to make too that um, uh, I always you know they talk about that, oh it's too much when it's you know too emotional too sentimental um, and, and this is sort of my one of my you know, puns. <laughs> uh, if it's too much, it's not enough, because then it's o- overtly trying to be sentimental, yeah. and of course, then it doesn't work. So it's not enough. It, it, yeah, it's exactly. So. It's, it's that's yeah. very very true, because I don't think that uh, music can ever instill too much emotion. But if it tries too yeah. much, 
Yeah, yeah. It's, so, it's, it is, it is like that in many, th many things in life. If you try too hard yeah. uh, and you want something and you, oh, you try and you try, you, you want to force someone to love you. you know? <laughs> yes, forcing, yes, exactly. Then it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Then it doesn't work. And mm -hmm. it's a matter of fear. It's a matter of confidence. Uh, you have to be confident, but, 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 uh, but, but you can also be overly confident. But it's, 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 it's more, it's first and foremost of losing, losing the fear. Mm -hmm. Losing the fear. It's much easier said than done. Much easier said than done. Yeah, but it starts uh, with being conscious about it at least. It, that's a start. Being conscious about it, you have to be conscious. I think so. Hmm. Um, uh, being conscious about that you have fear, hmm. and then you have to uh, somehow, uh, uh, yeah, lose yeah. your fear. No, no, I think, think you're completely. Let's right. not go there. No, no. <laughs> that's another hour. Yeah. Um, no, I think that that's a uh, perfect uh, sort of ending to this whole thing. That that um, it's not a question of you know, not to be having been affected by modern values because then you're impure or whatever, but to be aware of it and confront it so that you can yeah. improve. It's, yeah. And uh, because uh, uh, accept, accept that it exists. And uh, I have, uh, I, I do have many uh, f uh, also uh, friends and colleagues who, who do work with the modernist art and I respect their work uh, uh, too. Actually, I, I, I really do. Uh, I, I'm just doing what I want to do and I'm just working on losing my fear and losing my fear of both being too classical or losing my fear of being uh, affected by, by, by the modern. It's, it, really doesn't, it really doesn't matter. The, 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 what, what matters in the end is, is this good music. And I, I, I expect, I value personally, this is also a very subjective but there are some objectivity in it too. I do believe that if you can create an, em, an, uh, an emotional journey, if you like, uh, within the audience, if you can absorb the audience and instill emotion in them, if you can make them have goosebumps, if you can make them, if you can go in and speak to them in that way, I think you have created something that have, mer that have mer merit. Perfect punchline. Felix Magle, thank you so much for coming to the KO Pelvis. Thank you for the invitation. It's been a great pleasure. I'd also like to thank our top sponsors, Fergus Ryan, Anders Berge Christensen, Alistair Blaine, Eric Lasky, Jared Fountain, Michael Irish, Sean Roberts, Stacey Evangelista, Trim Jordal, Peter Assinger, Hermann Borge, Elizabeth Freeman, Jack Enns Warner, Jon Harald Aspheim, Tornelis Rugos, Trim Jordal and Ingve Helland for making this show possible. And remember to go to kopelis.com slash subscribe and become a member today. I'll see you next month.